Good evening or good day, depending on what part of the world you're in. Thank you very much for your joining us for this event on ancient Peruvian cultures and their relationship with their landscapes, which is part of the British Museum's public program, which accompanies uh, the exhibition Peru or Journey in Time, currently being presented at the British Museum, which is on until February 20th and which is supported by Plan Peru and organized with the Museo de Arte de Lima in Peru. My name is Cecilia Pardo. I'm the lead curator of the exhibition alongside Diego Cooper, former head of the Americas at the British Museum. And when we, in the very early stages of this project, when we started to think about a concept for this exhibition uh, that would present the history and cultural achievements of the Peruvian cultures that inhabited the Andean region before the arrival of the Spanish in the mid 16th century and their legacy into the present. Um, we came with the idea that one of the main topics should be the way these amazing societies managed to survive, adapt and thrive in one of the most amazing remarkable but challenging environments in the planet because peru sits in the heart of the central andes and the central andean region has hundreds of life zones one of the driest deserts in the world but just beside one of the richest oceans in the world which provided with huge maritime resources for these societies and then towards the east the highlands um, inhabited with the Andes and the Cordilleras, where the pre-Columbian societies managed to develop uh, through technologies and through a lot of creative technologies, agriculture, and, and create, develop agri agriculture in one of the highest altitudes in the world. And then towards the east, towards the border with Brazil, comes the Amazon, which is totally another universe. So all of the exhibition relates in many ways with these landscapes and the objects that we see in the exhibition, pottery, textiles, metal, boots, uh, shells, they all have something to do with, the, with these landscapes. Today, we have the pleasure to have three archeologists who have dedicated many years of their academic career to the study of sites and cultures all of them related to coastal sites, to coastal sites and cultures which developed in these dry deserts. Um, we're starting with a geoarchaeologist, Dr. Um, Ana Cecilia Mauricio, uh, who will talk about the work she's been doing in a valley called Chao, which is in the north uh, coast of Peru. Um, and the work she's done on reconstructing past climates and environments and the way uh, this has improved in our understanding, especially, and I think uh, Ana Cecilia's talk will be key because it fills a gap, a gap that we haven't be ab been able to uh, address in, in the exhibition, which are pre-ceramic pre pre sites and cultures. So the, in the exhibition, we start with Chavin. So Ana Cecilia will take us like back in time uh, then we'll have Dr. Marcus Reindel, who will draw on recent research related to Paracas and Nazca cultures and the influence of climate changes on the development of pre-Hispanic societies in southern Peru. Marcos will be joining us from Bonn. And I have to say that Marcos, uh, Marcos is a colleague we've worked before in the past. Uh, his research alongside Johnny Isla in Peru and have, have dedicated more than 20 years to the study of trying to understand the Nazca culture, their relationship with the amazing Pampas, those 500 square kilometers of Pampas where the Nazca depicted these drawings, but also the changes in the environments within these deserts. And finally, Gabriel Prieto, who will talk, Dr. Gabriel Prieto, who will talk about the coastal societies and their sustaining relationship with the Pacific Ocean. I think uh, Gabriel's talk will be key because that's one of the main topics also that we address in the exhibition, those relationships of these societies with this, with, with, with the ocean, with the, with the coast. And 
if you've seen the exhibition, probably one of the videos that attract more attention is the way we incorporate the experience of Victor Huamanchumo, who is a fisherman who has been using Totora reed boat technologies in his life, in his fishing. And we bring his voice into the exhibition and he reflects on his, on his own relationship with his past. So we place that video in front of a moche vessel dating to 380 in order to think about the, those legacies or those technologies that still endure. So um, just to say that we're happy, we're, thanks, uh, we're very thankful to have you all. And over to you, Ana Cecilia. Um, I'm gonna present Ana Cecilia, who is a Peruvian archeologist with more than 15 years of experience in Andean archeology. span she has an um, MS in Quaternary and Climate Studies and a PhD in Geoarchaeology from the University of Maine. She specializes in environmental and geoarchaeological approaches in the pre-Hispanic Andes. Since 2010-12, Dr. Mauricio has led an interdisciplinary uh, work in the Chao Valley of the Northern Coast, studying the development of monumentality and social complexity during the late pre-ceramic period and the role played by the local climate and environment. She has published different articles and edited volumes about her research. Currently, she is professor of archaeology in the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, editor of the Boletín de Arqueología in this university, and an explorer for National Geographic. Now over to you, Ana Cecilia. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, good evening and good afternoon here in Peru. First of all, I'd like to thank um, the British Museum, the curators and organizers of this exhibition for inviting me uh, uh, to this event. And um, in this presentation, in this brief presentation, I will try to highlight the relationship between the ancient people from coastal Peru with the local environment and climate phenomena and how this relationship was important to develop the first coastal civilization in Peru more than 5,000 years ago. So I guess I have to start um, talking about, by talking about the local, the local setting. This is going to be a very brief, uh, uh, very short summary of the, the most important aspect of the, the, the coast of Peru. Um, the coast of Peru is, um, um, is a narrow strip between the Pacific Ocean and, um, and the Andean mountains. I hope you are seeing well my presentation. Not very sure now. So it's a it's not narrow strip between the, the Pacific Ocean and the Andean mountains, which are the main factors that uh, made the characteristics of the, the, the geographic and climate characteristic of the, the uh, Peruvian coast. Um, the Peruvian coast is, is a desert, it's one of the driest deserts in the world, and it gets drier when we move southward. The, this is a desert because the lack of precipitation in most of its territory. And there is a lack of precipitation because we have a, a cool ocean current and high Andean mountains that prevent precipitation and condensation. So in, in the coast of Peru, we have two ocean currents, actually, the equatorial current up in the north edge of the country, which has uh, warm waters, and also uh, uh, the Peruvian or Humboldt current uh, that has um, cool waters. And this is present along most of the, the, the coast. And also the, the Peruvian current makes this area a upwelling zone, which, is, uh, uh, which makes this, this part of the Peruvian coast a, a very rich and a very productive marine environment. Um, and these two currents also create different landscapes and different environments, warm waters, more tropical environment, more tropical landscape, and cool waters, more dry environment, more dry landscape. Um, but uh, despite the lack of precipitation, water is present in, in the, the coast of Peru. 
the main source of fresh water are the coastal rivers that sit on the Andean mountains, the upper part of the valley, and run westward and drain into the Pacific Ocean, creating along its ways, uh, along the ways, uh, oases of life and very rich and productive, very important uh, riverine ecosystems that are important for, for human life. And these are the places where the uh, main cities, main coastal cities are located nowadays. Um, another, another important environment in the coast of Peru are the uh, estuaries, um, wetlands, and coastal lagoons, um, which are present along most of the, the, the coast of Peru and are important places, ecosystems, rich in uh, plant resources, animal resources, and water because of the presence of microorganisms that nourish uh, plants and also feed animals and uh, different kinds of animals like birds and fish, and also are important source of fresh water. Um, another key ecosystem on, of the Peruvian coast are the coastal lomas, which, which are the um, which are vegetation that feed on fog that is very predominant during the winter here on the central coast and on the south coast. And these also are important areas, these important ecosystems that are very rich in plant resources, uh, animal resources, and a very important source of fresh water. Um, so these are um, the, uh, some of the most important characteristics of the, of the Peruvian coast. It's a desert, but there is water and there, is, uh, there are important ecosystems there. And the other part of, the, of this talk is monumentality and monumental sites and, and um, uh, civilization. So monumentality, we can understand uh, this, this term by relating this term to um, complex monuments in some, in some cases, uh, um, constructions like buildings, like temples, roads, and and um, um, important hydraulic work, for example, but that, that were built by people that we in archaeology, anthropology call civilization or complex societies, which are uh, normally uh, societies that are, that are developing um, complex form of social organization. They have urban centers, they have organized religion, they have uh, um, uh, uh, social stratification, hierarchy, for example, and economies, uh, highly productive economies, mostly based on agriculture. However, in Peru, the first uh, coastal civilizations appear to be a slightly different for, from other regions of the world. They, uh, they were not uh, uh, large populations. They were not mostly based on agriculture. They had a special relationship with the ocean and marine ecosystems. And for this reason, the Michael Mosley in the 70s proposed this hypothesis that uh, um, states that uh, the Andean civilization was based on uh, was based on maritime or marine economy, and that mo and most and most of the protein and the most important economic resources came from the ocean, complemented by agriculture. Um, and this is being in debate uh, in, since the 70s. And um, it is a still important, an important idea for what we see in early sites, in early monumental sites along the Peruvian coast. An important place, an important area um, with uh, early monumental sites in Peru is the north of Chico, which is north of, of Lima and is formed by four small valleys and has uh, tens, more than 30 archaeological sites with early um, monumental buildings and, and this region has the most impressive uh, uh, architecture of this time. These are pre-ceramic populations. Uh, they developed some form of agriculture, but they, they weren't based on agriculture uh, as the main economic activity. They had a very important relationship with the ocean. I'm showing here some of these sites. The most, most famous of these sites is Caral, the, the largest of these sites in the north of Chico that has pyramids, plazas, open places, ceremonial structure, places for, con for the congregation of people. So, um, and some of these sites are very impressive for, for the time of that the, when they were built. This is, for example, the Great Pyramid of, of Caral. And you see uh, 
this pyramid with several plazas and and some large buildings in places for, uh, as I said, the congregation of people. Um, and most of them share some similar characteristics in architecture, pyramids and plazas, for example. And the, in the North Coast, there are some early examples also, like, for example, the, the, uh, the building uh, in the site the Chimbajo in the Casma Valley, north of the North of Chico, where archaeologists found um, a sunken circular plaza and a platform dating more than 5,000 years old. And there is another region that recently has uh, um, um, given archaeology um, uh, some early examples of this uh, early complex architecture. And this is a Chao Valley where I've been working for more than nine years now. And it's located on the on the north coast. This is the location of the uh, Chao Valley on the on the coast of Peru. And I work in this area called Pampa de las Salinas, which is uh, on the south part of the of the of the valley, south margin of the of the valley. And it's a very particular area because it has a dry embayment and a paleo shoreline. It's a very dry uh, uh, landscape. Uh, here you can see the the uh, the paleo shoreline. In, with this um, um, yellow line indicating that this was the, the uh, shoreline uh, several thousand years ago. The ocean was closer to this, this area. But uh, this, uh, this place, Pampa de las Salinas, is now a very dry environment. No, there is no vegetation, no population, almost no animals. The, the, the nearest fresh water source is the South River, which is seven kilometers from, the, from this place. And the Pacific Ocean is four kilometers from here. Um, uh, but uh, despite this not very friendly environment, there are more than 20 archaeological sites here, all of them pre ceramics that were discovered by a team of archaeologists led by Mercedes Cárdenas in the 1950s, in the 1970s. Um, and some of these are very, um, are examples of very early. Uh, ceremonial sites, like for example, Morteros, which is a site that has more than 5,000 uh, years old, actually 5,700 years old, and it's a mound covered entirely in, in sand. It's, uh, it's located along the edge of this paleo shoreline, paleo shoreline. And you can see here this uh, 3D photo showing some examples of the architecture that we have found here. Uh, we found um, early monumental adobe architecture, adobe, which are mud bricks. And this is the earliest example of adobe monumental architecture found in the, in the Americas, in the whole continent. And it is, uh, uh, these are structures, uh, rooms, rectangular rooms, uh, uh, made for congregation of a small group of people for doing some ceremonies. But this site also, uh, has some architecture made of stone, also ceremonial architecture with this uh, typical standing, large standing stone placed in the middle of some, some rooms that are typical from the ceremonial uh, pre-ceramic sites. <clears throat> and Morteros for this area was the beginning of the creation of what we call a ceremonial landscape, a, a complex, uh, um, a, a ceremonial um, from during the pre-ceramic area. And in this area, we found also several sites, large sites made of stone with architecture that is mostly related to ceremonies, the congregation of people, like for example, los pescadores or piedras negras that are located in the same area in Pampa de las Salinas, very close, very close to each other. And Salinas de Chao is the largest of these, with several plazas and structures, uh, and also this area has these particular structures, these geoglyphs that are um, um, very particular from other geoglyphs in, in the Andes. This is Cruz del Sur, or Crux. It is the name comes from the constellation Crux, and is formed by a circular marks on the ground made with stones uh, that, are, that are inside this uh, um, large square structures. Um, this is um, um, the, the name came from or was given by this uh, group of archaeologists who discovered this in the, in the late 70s. 
and they related this form with the constellation. There are five of this area along these, these uh, Pampa de las Salinas and in the whole area of Pampa de las Salinas. This is another one and with the same characteristics. And the hypothesis is that they probably are replicating constellations. We are, this is an hypothesis in progress. We are still uh, studying these, these geoglyphs, but these are structures that were built for people to get in and to participate in some sort of collective activity. This is how the geoglyphs look from the ground. And in all these sites, the, the main remains, uh, economic remains um, are from the ocean. There is a high uh, uh, amount of marine resources, marine remains, and a wide variety of resources from sea lions to sharks and birds and all sorts of fish and shellfish. And also there's evidence of cotton, which is the, the, the most abundant botanical re plant remain in all these sites and other, and other uh, plants like, for example, avocado and some peppers and some gourds. So, all these sites together, uh, they are contemporary also, uh, most of them, and, are, and we're forming a, a ceremonial, pre-ceramic ceremonial complex. And, but uh, an important question here is why in this place and, and why in a, in, in a place that, look, uh, that looks like what it looks today, a very unfriendly environment. And we did some environmental studies and to see how uh, to try to reconstruct the, the environment from the past. And we, uh, we think, we propose that the, that, that part of the, of the Chao Valley was more or less what it is, the, the northern part of the, of the Chao River mouth with a very interesting environment with coastal lagoons, estuaries, and, um, and, and wetlands that provide also fresh water, important plants and animal resources. Um, so <clears throat> um, recently there has been some studies uh, about the climate and, and environment and how a climatic phenomena in, in affected the life or, or were related with the life of people in pre-Hispanic Peru. And one of, especially, uh, there has been a lot of studies about El Nino, which is a atmospheric and, and ocean phenomenon that altered the, not the normal regime of the, the dry coast of Peru, uh, warming up the ocean waters and also bringing heavy rainfall. And, and in these studies, um, we, we, we are understanding that the El Nino uh, had a very different uh, behavior during the time, and particularly, particularly for the time that I, that I studied, which is the pre ceramic period, um, there is an important um, change in the El Nino regime. Uh, between 9,000 and 6,000 years ago, there was like an absent or a very weak El Nino behavior, after which from 6,000 to 3,000 years ago, El Nino restarted and became more frequent and with more and more intense. And from 3000 and, and the, um, from 3000 to recent, more recent periods, El Nino became even stronger and more frequent, like more or less the regime that the Nino has in, actually in, in, in the present. And this is, um, in the, for the case, this change in the El Nino regime, for the case of El Chao Valley and the, the complex, the ceremonial complex of Pampa de las Salinas uh, has a very close relationship because the, the change of the regime from 6,000 to 3,000 coincides with the beginning of human occupation in the area, in the construction of the first ceremonial places here, the, the first uh, monumental sites here. And the change of the regime from 3000 uh, and on uh, also coincided with the abandonment of the area. And more recently, we've, we've been studying the, the adobe architecture and the adobe here are related uh, to El Nino because they were made with clay deposits that El Nino uh, deposited in the, in the river, in the Chao River mouth uh, more than 5,000 years ago. 
and and um, in in this was a deposit that was uh, um, used by the population to create the first uh, monumental architecture using adobes in in this area. Um, in the case of the Norte Chico, uh, there is a, an abandonment of the area, the end of the pre ceramic occupation by 3000 years ago, uh, 1000 BC, but it is also, it has been also related to El Nino evidence, like evidence of heavy rainfall, aeolian sand, and even earthquakes. Um, so, um, in, 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 in our days, the El Nino, has a very has a very bad um, meaning, if you will. Uh, we have a bad relationship with El Nino. It means destruction, destruction, loss of life, loss of uh, our economic resources, loss of in infrastructure. But also El Nino can be a a possibility because it's also water into this very dry environment. And and there is a there are studies that relate the uh, um, the um, growing of the lomas vegetation and in, and, and, in, and increase in the lomas uh, in the variety of the lomas plants because of El Nino and El Nino also can recharge groundwater that is source of fresh water in the in the Peruvian desert and also fertilize, fertilize the riverine environment um, and so. Uh, what we are seeing in the recent studies in these places, in these early uh, monumental sites, um, pre ceramic sites, is a close relationship with the population, with the coastal environment. It's not just uh, the ocean, but what the coast has in the, Peruvian, in, in the Peruvian territory, which is a very productive marine environment, but also estuaries, but also coastal lagoons, wetlands, lomas and El Nino, the phenomenon, phenomenon that can be bad or is bad for us, it is negative, it is something negative for us in the present, but it was, an, it was different and it could be different. People in the past could have a very different relationship with na nature. And I think that also, it is, that's also something that led us archeologists to understand better the past, but for us, for society nowadays also, teach us that we can have a different relationship with our nature and our climatic phenomena. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ana Cecilia. That was amazing and really, really new research. Just, just a note to say that we'll leave the Q&A for the end after we finish with, with Gabriel. Uh, so now my pleasure is to present uh, Dr. Marcus Reindel and Marcus is a senior researcher at the Americas Division of the Commission of Archaeology of Non-European Countries at the German Archaeological Institute, an honorary professor at the Institute for American Anthropology of the University of Bonn in Germany. He studied American Anthropology, Ethnology, Geography, and Spanish at the University of Freiburg, Madrid, and Bonn, where he received his PhD in 1991. In the following years, he directed in their interdisciplinary research projects on settlement patterns and architecture in Ecuador, Mexico, Peru, and Honduras. His main interests are in settlement archaeology, architecture, archaeometry, landscape, archaeology, paleoclimatology, and the origin of complex societies in the Central and South America. Currently, he's engaged in archaeological projects on the north coast of Honduras and in the landscapes and settlement studies in, in the region of Nazca. Thanks very much, Marcus. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, thank you to uh, Cecilia Mauricio also for the introduction to the coastal environment of uh, Peru. Uh, Cecilia has been talking about the northern part of uh, Peru, and we are moving now to the southern part, uh, especially to the Nazca area, which is very famous by its geoglyphs. And as you can see in this slide of South America, uh, uh, there is a remarkable difference between the green areas to the east and the light areas to the west, especially where the rectangle is. And this is, of course, uh, the desert area of Pacific 
uh, Peru. And we uh, will have now a closer look on this area and not only on the coast, but also uh, we are going at the end of my presentation a little bit to the highlands, which you can see here on the right side of this uh, slide. And uh, you can see here the typical morphology of the coast, which is a little bit uh, larger than the, the distance between the Pacific Ocean, the shoreline, and the feet of the Andes, <clears throat> which is about 70 kilometers. And uh, what you can see here is the tributaries of the Rio Nascar River, uh, 10 tributaries uh, which uh, flow together and uh, carry the water from the western flank of the Andes to the Pacific Ocean. So this is uh, the environment where the uh, cultures in the Nazca area develop. And as you can imagine, the main living areas were the river oasis. And here is where we find uh, many uh, settlements. So uh, here you can see a typical um, uh, oasis in the Palpa Valley with a marked difference between the desert, completely arid um, um, uh, environment, which is uh, desert, uh, and the uh, river with its coastal oasis where cultivation is done with uh, irrigation cultivation. So um, another view of the area is here from the air. Uh, we can see on the right and the left the three rivers in the Palpa area and in between uh, one of these spores uh, at the feet of the Andes and in the middle you can see the famous geoglyphs which are so characteristic for the area. What you cannot see on the slide is the many many remains of ancient settlements which are on the edges of the valleys and which have been investigated by our project. We can see here a map of the settlements uh, on the foothills of the Andes uh, in the Palpa area. Uh, many settlements of different time periods and I just want to give you some examples of what we found. Uh, this is a very early settlement of archaic times 3800 BC and you can uh, see the pit houses with, which are characteristic for this early forms of uh, first uh, sedentarism. And uh, later uh, in the Paracas period, which was famous, the predecessor of the Nazca culture, here we can see one of a completely preserved untouched settlement with a, load, a lot of uh, funerary context which allowed us to refine very much the chronology. And uh, here is the reconstruction of one of the settlements of the famous Nazca culture. And you can see here the mud architecture and uh, some characteristics of this architecture. So um, the settlements varied a lot over time, they changed their location, uh, their characteristic, their structure, and so on, which indicated to us that many things happened in the past and what motivated us uh, to look also for the reasons which uh, may have changed uh, the situation. And one of the region, uh, reasons may have been uh, changing climate. So this motivated us to make the first uh, test pits to look at the stratification, the natural stratification, which shows in this slide very clearly that there were different climatic events um, producing deposits of uh, different characteristics. Sedimentation, fine sedimentation, very strong sedimentation, and probably even caused by rainfalls. So uh, together with um, specialists in climatology and geomorphology, uh, we did uh, sedimentological studies on the coast. And one of the main starting point were these little 
patches, which we archaeologists had not considered very much in our studies, but these are remains of what we call with the German word Löss, which is a very fine grained aeolic sediment, which uh, can deposit only on the ground if there is a vegetation cover. So this Löss uh, is then an indirect indicator of uh, an existing vegetation in the past. So fortunately, well, this is an image from a neighboring valley, from the Palpa Valley, where there is less erosion and where the layers of less alas are still very thick. And fortunately, uh, we have methods to investigate and to date the deposition of these uh, sediments. And uh, by this means, and also many other sedimentological studies, we couldn't reconstruct the climatic changes in the past. And this was very interesting, mainly in the period we were interested in. Uh, and I start here with uh, the indication of the desert margin until the second millennium BC. And in later years, this changed dramatically, indicating climatic climatic changes. So 200 BC, it moved to the east. Uh, the desert margin moved farther to the east, indica indicating a process of aridification in the time of the existence of the Paracas and the Nazca culture. And this influenced very much the cultural development. Uh, this reached a peak around 600 AD, a time uh, characterized by a large drought and which caused the Nazca population to abandon this region and to go to other places. So the um, very driest uh, situation is around 800 AD and then the situation reversed completely and the desert margin moved again to the west, so it became wetter again in what we call the late intermediate period. And today, again, we have the desert margin here much more to the east. So if we combine this evidence with our archaeological evidence of settlement patterns, a very interesting picture arises. So we have here, for example, the early and middle Nazca period. And in the graphic to the left, the black uh, blocks indicates um, amounts of humidity. And we can already see that humidity had decreased until the early and middle Nazca period. And then it uh, became even more dry. The desert margin, which is here marked with this a blue line moved up to the mountains and in the so-called middle horizon, uh, it was very dry, which caused an abandonment of the region and very few settlements remained in the area. So this means uh, many things happened in this region caused by climatic changes. And at the end, uh, these climatic changes even uh, motivated the people to abandon the Palpa valleys. And the great question for us was, uh, where did the people go? And in earlier times, where did the people come from? So we, we expanded our research area also to the highland to see the interaction with this higher part of the countries. And what we found there in an area which was uh, completely uninvestigated, we found many other settlements and um, terraced uh, areas for agriculture, um, which we didn't su uh, suspect before. And most interesting, uh, we find the same cultural materials in the highlands, uh, like on the coast. So this means that the cultural um, the, the cultures which were 
on the coast extended to the highlands, in this case in the Nazca period, but also in the uh, preceding Paracas period. So when we now map the settlement distribution through time for these earlier times, and we see here the middle Paracas period, about 600 to 400 BC, we can see in the, on the right side of the slide, which represents the highlands, a major con uh, concentration of settlements, while on the left side, which represents the coast, there are only very few settlements. And this changes uh, through time. In the late Paracas period, we have, have, have many more settlement already on the coast. And it seems that people definitely moved down from the highlands to the coast to settle the fertile valleys on the coast, on the foothills, on the Andes. And this is what we have in the early Nazca uh, period, which is the flourishing period, uh, period of the Nazca culture, which uh, is famous for the geoglyphs and this nice ceramics. So um, we have then um, paleo environmental evidence from the coast. And uh, we wanted to know if this matches uh, other evidences from the highlands. So we looked for geo archives in the highlands and we found one in these uh, cushion peatlands, which are a kind of peat box of plants, um, very uh, humid. And in this very humid environment, the plants are growing up and growing up and uh, forming a cushion through time, which can be investigated with uh, geoarchaeological methods. We can see here our colleagues drilling a core after defining the deepest parts of uh, the peat box and here drilling down 10 meters and uh, extracting a core with sedimentation which spans more or less 8,000 years. This could be determined by uh, radiocarbon datings of the different layers. And uh, by this way, we could parallel the um, geomorphological layers with the cultural periods, and then analyze the macrobotanical remains, which are perfectly pre uh, preserved through the uh, centuries, and also we could do uh, pollen analysis and also the sediment analysis. And this gives us a very clear picture of the development of the climatic changes. And I can show this on uh, this slide, which is one example of the pollen analysis, which shows quite clearly uh, how the record develops. We have here in this part the middle horizon, and we saw before that the middle horizon is a very uh, dry period, the period when um, the foothills of the Andes were nearly abandoned. So we have here a record of grasses, and grasses like humidity. So if uh, it's dry, uh, the grasses retire, and this is what we can see here. It drops very strongly down. And on the other case, uh, on the other hand, we have here the pollen of shrubs, and shrubs like the dryness. And you see, like these two curves perfectly match, and this indicates what uh, we had seen also on the coast. This development of an extreme dry period indicated here by uh, the growing shrubs and the retirement of the grasses. And so we could see definitely that the record, the paleoclimatic record of the highland, highland matched the one of the coast. So this means um, to sum up that 
definitely there were many changes in paleoclimate in the past. Uh, contrary to the opinion which we could read 20, 30 years ago in our book that said uh, the desert was always there and didn't change. No, this is not true. There were many changes which influenced the cultural development, and this can be traced by geoarchaeological investigation and combining them uh, with the archaeological in investigations. So this was uh, my presentation, and I give over to Cecilia again. Thank you very much, Marcus. We'll wait till the end. I'm sure a lot of questions will arise. Our final panelist is uh, Dr. Gabriel Prieto. Uh, Gabriel is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Florida. And since 2010, he has been working on coastal sites in the central and north coast of Peru. Prieto has published extensively on fishing technology, social dynamics of early fishing settlements, subsistence strategies and the excavation of small scale, scale early ceremonial centers on the north coast of Peru. He has also published on large scale human sacrifice of the Chimu society along the coast of the Moche Valley and on an ethnography of traditional present day maritime communities of the Peruvian north coast. He's co-editor of Maritime Communities of the Ancient Andes along with Dr. Daniel Sandwhite. And he's an explorer of the National Geographic Society, a member of the Institute of Andean Studies, and the recipient of the 2019 Shanghai Archaeology Forum Award for his contributions to the field for the discovery of the largest child sacrifice in the ancient world. Over to you, Abel. Um, thank you very much, Cecilia, and all the members of the British Museum for inviting us. Um, I'm very honored to share um, the discussion today with Dr. Cecilia Mauricio and with Dr. Uh, Marcus Reindel. So um, um, what I'm going to do today is um, going to focus a little more on the, um, on the people that settles in this case on the north coast of Peru. I'm just going to try to uh, drive through a kind of journey through uh, some of the sites that we have excavated over the last um, few years in the area. So um, I'm not going to spend much time here. Uh, again, the, this is the north coast of Peru in South America. And um, the area that I would like to focus is on the Moche Valley, um, perhaps one of the most important in the region because of the accumulation of early complex societies in this area, kind of a dramatic um, environment like the, the ones uh, previously um, exposed by uh, Dr. Mauricio and Dr. Grindel. But interestingly enough, in this valley, uh, at least through the last 3,000 years, we have an interesting concentration of at least the three most or some of the most important uh, settlements in, uh, during this time, uh, starting with the site of Caballo Muerto around um, um, 3,000 years ago, um, an important settlement of the so-called uh, initial period and early horizon. Um, then the Huacas de Moche, another important settlement for uh, the late, the early intermediate period, and perhaps one of the first uh, large uh, cities in this in 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 the Andes, and then uh, the city of course of Chan Chan, which is um, the largest um, urban settlement I would say uh, in the Americas uh, during its time, um, and perhaps one of the most important in the world at the time too. Um, Trujillo during the colonial um, period when the Spanish came around uh, became also an important hub for um, colonial control and uh, the colonial city is there too. But my, my focus today is on the northern side of the valley and in, you know, specifically on the coastal side where um, the traditional community of Huanchaco is located today. So we are trying to understand the social dynamics and the economic interactions of, of these fishermen and how these people interacted with these major socio-political um, um, entities and transformations through time. So we, we, we would like to build up from the common people and see how they interacted with these large movements that you see here on this slide. So Huanchaco is today a tourist destination, an important um, a fishing village, but also uh, is, is, the, is the settlement is perhaps um, one of the last uh, spots al across uh, along the coast of Peru 
that has these traditional fisheries uh, using reed boats, a very ancient, very old uh, fishing device. But um, this is the symbol and be behind this, there is the, the people. And uh, part of my project since I grew up in Huanchaco is trying to bring the voice of this community that is uh, struggling today to keep uh, their traditional ways of life in a modern world. But at the same time, they are having other threats like urban expansion, uh, pollution, and the continuous uh, and dramatic changes in the climate in the last few years, specifically on coastal erosion. Um, since we talked about fishermen, we tend to focus on, 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 on the fishermen, but um, the project is also interested in learning more about the women who were also part of this, that, that are part of this community and that they have an important role um, in, uh, in the constitution of, of the dynamics of this, of this early, uh, of this uh, community. So um, throughout my presentation, I'm gonna show some evidence uh, that also orients the discussion towards the role played by gender um, in ancient societies and especially in these small scale communities. So Huanchaco um, uh, has suffered major transformations uh, in the last uh, 100 years. This is Huanchaco in, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, very simple community, no more than 500 people, um, very traditional way of life and uh, with a very selective fisheries. Uh, sometimes we tend to uh, confuse uh, uh, what we see in the archaeological record, but it seems that these traditional communities are targeting some species that yields more meat than just uh, trying to get a small fish. Um, but then years later, when Chaco became uh, from this small town into a massive uh, um, a residential site of more than 25,000 people, um, most of their tradi the traditional religious uh, uh, practices, um, they, they are most of them are, are, are Catholic practitioners, shift from this kind of community-based, family-based um, uh, rituals and ceremonies into massive uh, tourist uh, attractions and shows, which shows uh, to us how this community change and adapt to the new uh, social circumstances. And part of this, part of, of, of what I'm trying to do here is to understand if these social changes were also happening in the past. So how did this, the, the, the Huanchaco community has transformed themselves? For example, at the advent of the Moche um, uh, society or when the Chimus were in the area, you know, uh, controlling and doing uh, um, a massive concentration of people in the city of Chancha. So, um, but, but again, the focus is to, to understand this connection between the sea and the people and then uh, all the relations around. So um, the other thing is that um, when Chaco is today considered um, the, the, the cradle of surfing, and I know that people in Hawaii don't like this, but uh, when Chaquero feels very proud, and um, although I, I sustain that, that the reed boats were specifically designed to cross the waves, they, are, they were certainly used you know, to, uh, to have some fun. And today is also a major uh, attraction in, in Huanchaco, which is another social change today because uh, they are still depending on the sea, you know, now on the surfing industry, but, um, uh, but the sea is the connection that they have uh, with this. So, um, but going more to the archeology span and some, uh, Dr. Mauricio already mentioned it, um, there is a whole theory about the importance of the maritime foundations and how that set of the, the, the rise of social complexity. And um, one of the questions that we have is that we will can try to test these hypotheses uh, uh, in, in, in a coastal settings, because it, it seems to me that this, th this thesis was mostly um, tested on large scale uh, settlements like uh, temples and large, uh, uh, large monumental uh, uh, buildings, but not necessarily uh, where, where most of the people lived at the time. So um, in order to do so, uh, we've been digging several sites in the coast of Huanchaco, basically from different time periods. Uh, I'm just going to show a couple of them today. Um, Gramalote is one of the earliest ones that we have excavated. There are some earlier ones, but uh, we focus on Gramalote that is around the initial period, um, 3,500 years ago, 1500 BC. Um, one of the things that we realize is that um, Gramalot is not just a, a wasn't just a um, maritime community, but he was he was surrounded by a number of natural resources, and that those natural resources were heavily exploited. So, uh, depending on how much these people can walk and get 
to these areas, they were uh, basically um, exploiting all these resources and not just uh, the, the ocean. The site was about 3.5 hectares, around 500 people live there. Uh, and it has two very clear sectors, a residential sector in the south, and then this uh, ceremonial sector on the northeast side. Uh, houses were basically uh, very small. Most of the activity areas happening in the patios as any other pre-industrial society at the time. Um, but the interesting thing is that there is a number of evidence to, to suggest that uh, marine resources were not only used for food and for subsistence practices, but they were immediately included and probably well before um, for uh, domestic rituals that probably were emphasizing the role played by, by the sea, not only in the economic scale, but also in the, in the ideological sphere. Um, this is also very present in this a small temple that these, that these people built. Um, it's, a, it's around a thousand square meters, but not a, a high platform, but rather a flat monument, a flat building enclosed by a big wall with a central a rectangular plaza. And uh, this is a photo just to show you the scale and the size. So these people were embedded not only in domestic rituals, but also they had a kind of formal uh, com a, a community space to uh, perform their um, uh, ceremonies and, and religious uh, practices. So they were not necessarily depending on large temples. So one of the challenges now is to understand the connection between these communities and the temples, and then these little temples in their own communities, and how all this played together a role you know, to build up a society. In terms of, uh, of the people there, uh, there is an interesting pattern. Almost all the adult women were buried in, within the houses, in the domestic area. And in those areas, they were in charge not only on food preparation, but they were doing a number of, things, uh, of activities that I call uh, household industries. They were in charge of uh, doing marine and basketry and, and also weaving. And there is some evidence here and, and, and some connections with modern activities done by women in Huanchaco. Um, but they were also shell gatherers and seaweed gatherers. Uh, there is a very interesting pattern of, uh, of um, fractures in the in the in the in the feet in the foot bones that uh, is is very similar to what happens to uh, shell gatherers today in Huanchaco because they hit the stones as they walk in in the process of gathering, especially uh, sea crabs and and seaweeds. So that's an uh, an, an important aspect, and also. Uh, Today, in the context of Huanchaco, women are in charge of exchanging the products or selling of selling the products that are produced basically by their husbands and, 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 rel and, and male relatives. And in Gramalote, there is a very interesting pattern that almost all women has these uh, severe uh, um, injuries, and not, not, not injury, but some deformations in their lumbar uh, vertebrae because they were apparently uh, carrying uh, and loading uh, um, uh, heavy weights on, in, in, in their backs. So this is also an interesting aspect. In terms of men, of course, they were devoted to fishing practices. Um, there are some evidence of miniatures of reed boats that you can see in this picture. Um, they were heavily relying on sharks. I mean, they were getting anchovies and other medium-sized fish, but sharks apparently for some reason were very important for this community. We have in the thousands, more than 16,000 remains of sharks. Um, and we have found not only the vertebrae, but the teeth as well. So probably copper sharks and blue sharks were the bulk of the diet there. For some reason that we are still under investigation around 1100 BC, and then maybe we can talk with Marcus and Cecilia about this, um, they shift the, the, the location of, of, of the settlement towards the north to the area where Huanchaco is located today. So there was a major transformation, something that has to do with climate change with some catastrophe occurring, but also some interest, some cultural um, um, uh, interest. Um, I think that reed boats become more prominent uh, in later periods, and therefore they were looking for this kind of uh, uh, cove or little bay that was more suitable to use reed boats uh, in the area. For some reason, they moved there and they never came back to other area. When Chaco is still in the same area where you know these people lived around the Kupisnike period that is roughly between 1100, 800, uh, or 500 BC, whatever uh, you want to see this. Um, and this has to do probably with, the, as I said, with the uses of reed boats. Uh, we have the ceramics. We already have a, 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 a consistent set of 11 radiocarbon dates that goes between 1100 and 500 BC. And also the presence of Chavin culture is very well documented in this site. So hopefully we'll get a paper soon on this. 
Um, but the maritime connection, again, that some of these unfortunately uh, could be sneaker burials that were looted, were covered uh, by uh, whale, whale uh, reefs, as you can see in, this, in one of these looted burials. This was looted by the Salinar people around uh, a few hundred years later, so this is not modern looting. And inside, we have found half of a complete uh, whale uh, skull. So there is a, a, some interesting connections there. Um, for the next period, around uh, 400 BC, uh, the so-called Laterly Horizon, uh, Salinar, uh, as it is known in the north coast of Peru, there are two major sites in the Huanchaco area, uh, basically a residential area here, Pampa da Cruz, and a small um, um, cemetery and ceremonial area that is contemporaneous with this Pampa da Cruz uh, occupation. Um, the stratigraphy is very deep, it's very intense. There is no really evidence of, of gaps. There is a continuous occupation from 400 BC all the way up to the Mochi occupation at Pampa la Cruz and at Jose Olaya. We have now more than 55 radiocarbon days that hopefully we'll publish it soon that uh, con corroborates you know, this continuity in the, in the site. In some areas, the stratigraphy goes down as far, as far down as five meters. So uh, the, these very deep uh, layers uh, are covering a Salinar domestic occupation, very similar to what Brennan found in Cerro Arena in the same valley. But we also have very interesting burials that suggest for the first time the evidence of social inequality uh, within this maritime community. So the time when, when there is some social differentiation that you can infer you know, based on material culture, and this could be wrong, you know, is during this time period in the Salinar, the presence of gold artifacts, and also the, pot the potential evidence of some interpersonal violence that is not only present on the bones, some, some, some uh, injuries, some traumas, but also we have found these beautiful uh, maze, uh, stone maze heads that for many years people thought that these were Kupisnike, but these are clearly Salinar. I think that Richard Burger in 1993 were already suggesting that those were Salinar too. So we are just confirming this in, based on our excavations and, and contextual data. So we have uh, some gold ornaments. We have beautiful green mineral um, uh, necklaces probably coming from the highlands. We have gold beads as well, some of them that are beautifully uh, uh, inlaid and, and, and carved. Um, and we also have other more kind of modest burials, but it's still different from the you know, common ones. Uh, some of them have these alabaster that are, um, well, this is not properly alabaster. We don't, we don't really know, but it's a white stone. And it has, again, this, this bird uh, shaped with this interlocking design, again, making this connection with the sea. The red pigment there is cinnabar. We have tested, uh, thanks to uh, Brandon Risudo. And, um, and some of the burials have less offerings in terms of you know, uh, quality and, 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 and quantity, but they are buried intentionally in these uh, funerary chambers. So there is a very complicated process expressing the personhood of these individuals during this period that deserve more study. And my uh, grad student, uh, Jordi Rivera, is working this for her doctoral dissertation. But in, in the female burials, it's interesting that we also we always have this marine connection, these little limpets, you know, these little lapas, um, uh, making uh, uh, us uh, suggesting that they were connected with the sea and marine activities, regardless of this crazy um, 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 social moment that these people were experiencing. Some of the burials have a kind of very exotic products like parrots. And uh, one of my uh, former students, Janina Komeka, for her master thesis, she found the presence of Theobroma cacao. So we have cacao uh, documented in Huanchaco for um, 400 BC. And we have expanded the samples and this is not a isolated finding, we have many uh, um, and starch grains of cacao, suggesting that people in Huanchaco were in contact, in close contact with uh, upper Amazon uh, communities, probably from Jaén and other regions. Um, for the later period, around 100 BC, the so-called uh, Viru Society, there is evidence that Huanchaco community get engaged also in more interpersonal violence events. There is evidence of weapons, of, of, of uh, copper weapons, uh, present in the burials, uh, um, um, and also the presence of what we call uh, fisher chiefs. These uh, fisher chiefs uh, have, have a combination of uh, metal fish hooks, very large metal fish hooks, shark teeth, and also some weapons. So here are some of the teeth found on those burials. 
Uh, and then, you know, comparing with Gramalote, we can see a change in the, in the perception of the resource. Sharks were the bulk of the diet during the initial period. And then for the early intermediate period, the same community were having a more kind of ritualized perspectives on sharks. Sharks didn't uh, become more interesting or, or important again as diet, but they were a symbolic, a very symbolic uh, element in their burial. So probably they were trying to make in these ancient connections between and using the resources for their own um, uh, um, 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 interests. And as you can see here, the numbers of sharks during this period is, is very low in, in contrast with the ones at Gramalote where we have more than 16,000 remains. So uh, this is probably was taken from, the, from by the Moche. The Moche people were um, kind of adopting, I would say, if they were not taking uh, these uh, uh, previous uh, 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 thoughts or ideas developed by the Viru. And they were integrating this into their uh, uh, more official narrative. And, um, and this has to do, again, that most of the, of the large metal fish that, that the Moches are depicting are actually found on Viru elite burials in Huanchaco and not in the, in the, in the Moche ones. Um, however, the Moches came, and when I mean the Moches, I refer to the political organization, to the religious perspective or, or the religious influence. And they built on top of a Viru previous temple, a small one actually with mural paintings. And they made a very interesting offering. And this is going to be some of my last slides. Uh, what they did is a, a very interesting offering uh, that was located on the north side of the temple. And it was a very uh, complex uh, a, 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 a group of different a, a marine species. They buried two large whales, complete whales, uh, up to nine sharks, two uh, yellowfin tuna, uh, tunas, and uh, one stingray and two mola mola or sunfish. And uh, those were also buried with a couple of uh, sacrificed victims to adult humans. Um, also the skulls of a uh, pelican and a, um, and a sea lion. And here is one of the examples of the complete uh, in, in yellowfin tunas. As you can see, it's more than one meter long. Uh, some details, a beautiful preservation, extraordinary preservation. Uh, the two mola mola fish. Um, and also here you can see another details of, of the largest steam raid, some of the sharks. And then the two cohias, two, um, a two dead whales. As you can see here, possibly one male and one female. The female was pregnant. We found the fetus inside her. So this was also a very interesting finding and also this large stingray. And of course the sharks, as I said, nine of them uh, with the beautiful jaws still preserved. So, you know, in the Huanchaco community, they would have eaten all of those in other occasions. But in this, in this case, they were making a very valuable offering that reminds me of, you know, saving the limitations, of course, with uh, the Templo Mayor in Tenochtitlan, where they were trying to recreate, you know, different environments. In this case, they were clearly trying to recreate marine, a marine connotation. So um, there is a lot to do in Huanchaco uh, and learn about them. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm ready to answer any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel. That was really, really interesting. And showing your current research is like <laughs> new for all of us, I think. Uh, so we've had three different approaches, three different regions, but also three different periods, all of them related to different cultures that inhabited the coastal deserts. In, in the case of Cecilia and Gabriel, very close to the ocean. In the case of Marco, Marcus, not so close to the, to the coastline, but still desert. So we have a lot of questions. Um, we'll start with them. Uh, there's a question for Marcus. Uh, by digging around, how far back can you go in time by sediment analysis? 10,000 years, 100,000 years, 1 million years? Well, actually, we can go very far back, <laughs> um, <clears throat> depending on the uh, possibilities of dating it. And the geologists have their own means and techniques of dating. So uh, we can reconstruct the whole um, Earth history um uh, with uh, sedimentology um we are interested mainly of course in 
the period where uh, people occupied the landscape. And uh, for these periods, we have also very nice dating techniques, optical stimulated luminescence dating, and of course the radiocarbon dating, which gives uh, quite nice uh, datings uh, for our purposes. Yeah, I think what I what I learned for from your project, Marcus, it has that it has been always very, I don't know if interdisciplinary. So you brought different uh, expertise into un, into archaeology, and that I think it has helped a lot to further understand uh, how the Nazca developed. Um, yes. There's a question on 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 the term pre ceramic that I think it's more for Ana Cecilia. So does pre-ceramic mean no use of clay or was the clay just not baked or were the ovens not high enough in temperature to bake clay for ceramics? And how did they use and skill ceramics came into the region through trade? Thank you, that's a very interesting question. Um, it, is, it, it means that people in that period uh, until about, uh, almost 4,000 years ago, people in Peru did not use ceramics as we see ceramic vessels. But this doesn't mean that they didn't know how to use clay in other ways. We found uh, several examples of the use of clay, which is the base for the, the fabrication of ceramics. And we see that, for example, in the, in the, in the manufacture of adobe, this mud brick, we see clay, uh, in, in some sites, in some early uh, monumental sites on the coast of Peru in the form of figurines, the small, small, small figures made of clay. Some of them are, are depicting female, female characters. Um, and we see the use of clay in several uh, examples for uh, plastering the walls, the construction and the architecture. So people know how to use clay. People, people knew the characteristics of, of clay, the plastic characteristics and how the possibilities. This is not, um, the, the, the lack of ceramic is not like a technological stage in history. It's not that people couldn't um, figure out how to make ceramic, how to bake ceramic and, and, and have a vessel. Uh, we have in that in that uh, in that period um, in the in the in Ecuador, for example, people were using ceramic much earlier than than us in Peru. Uh, more than uh, a thousand years earlier, more than thousand years earlier, in Colombia also the same. And there is plenty of evidence that people from Peru and coast of Peru and the north coast of Peru were in contact with this population with people from from Ecuador and people from Colombia. And so probably they knew about ceramics, but they, it wasn't necessary perhaps for, for these people to have them. It wasn't necessary in perhaps in the economic uh, sense and also in the social sense. And they were using ceramics and they were using um, clay and, and the, um, in, in different ways. And so it's more, we, we, when we, enter to the ceramic stage in, in history, uh, we can use the word adoption of ceramic instead of the creation, because it is, it is not uh, for us, I, I, at, least for, at least for me, it's not that we um, make a technological advance, a technological change by creating ceramic. We adopt ceramic, uh, probably for cultural and social reasons, mm -hmm. rather than technical and technological reasons, yeah. Yeah, and, and we, we could say that like ceramics as containers and as use of kilns towards 2000, 1800, 2000 uh, BC, more or less. BC, almost, yeah, yeah. 2000 yeah. BC. Yeah. Um, Gabriel, how do you think, and Mm, the bowls of the Huanchaco region seem very similar to those of Lago Titicaca. Is there a connection? Um, there, there, there is not a connection. Um, although I have to say that the, the reed boats, as we see them, as we see today in Huanchaco, were actually similar to the ones in the Titicaca Lake back in the Moche times. 
uh, there, there were at least or six or seven different types of reed boats from very large vessels to this very simple one that is only for one person. So um, I would say that um, due to a number of reasons, uh, the reduction on the size of the, of the uh, marshlands were, uh, and the sunken gardens where the fishermen grow those uh, uh, reed boats, as old reed, sorry, known as uh, Totora, I think, um, they have been reducing the size of the reed boats uh, systematically. And, and there is a very complex uh, story behind, but there, there, there seems to be no, no, no connection. Now, there are other crazy things going on. For example, when the Inca times came, uh, we know that some of the Chimu people were moved up to the Puno, Puno area. And there are some communities in Puno that they claim to be descendants of the Chimus. And three years ago, uh, with a local NGO in, in Huanchaco, they brought these people together. They, they brought people from, from uh, this traditional community in Puno and they came to Huanchaco and they were sharing and talking about the techniques. I was trying to pay attention, you know, to how they work in, you know, uh, the, the, the Totora, but there seems to be different. But apparently there is some traditional knowledge that connects the community, but not, not, not necessarily the boats. There's, there's a question that I think maybe Marcos, how do you think people were able to live in such an arid climate? Yes, um, we are definitely in one of the driest deserts of the world. But as I have shown, there are rivers bringing, carrying the water from the highlands to the coast. So on these rivers are forming river oases. And by this means, people is able to bring water to the field to cultivate. And this causes uh, is a base for a very rich environment and a very productive agriculture. So these river oases were paradises in the past, little paradises in the desert and very attractive living areas. So they could easily live in these oases. Um, I don't know who could answer this question, but it's about mummification. So maybe Gabriel has been showing some burials. If I remember correctly, there is evidence showing that like the ancient Egyptians mummification was practiced in Peru. Was this practice limited to just one specific region and time within Peru's history? Or is there evidence to show that the many different complex societies of Peru were practicing some kind of mummification? That's a good question. Is a it will be take a, a lot to a, a lot time to yeah. a lot of time to answer, but I would say that uh, some of the earliest evidence of mummification, even earlier than the Egyptians, were the Chinchorro people in the in the southern region of Peru, northern Chile. Um, there is not much evidence of artificial mummification in in, in prehispanic Peru, as far as I know. Apparently, the Incas were practicing that, but uh, we don't have even most of the of the of the of the mummies that we have in in, in the coast of Peru and in the highlands were naturally uh, mummified. That is where it's a process of the very dry conditions of the, of the soil, the acidity, and many other factors affecting yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but not really evidence of, of, of uh, artificial mummification, uh, at least during the time periods that we have talked so far here. And, and I would just highlight two different regions where, where you see that practices like natural, uh, one is um, Chiribaya and the other one is Chachapoyas that Dr. Dr. Sonia Guillen has been studying for decades. And she is Peruvian and she's been uh, for many years linked with projects of um, physical anthropology to the British Museum. So if, if you're interested, you, uh, uh, it would be great to search for a um, Sonia Guillén's work here. What languages were spoken? So normally we think only Quechua was spoken, but um, we have to add Aymara, which was spoken in the Southern Highlands, Pukina, which also was like an isolated language, and the language spoken in the coast. I don't know, Gabriel, if you want to add something there. Um, well, I'm just going to say that uh, there were many languages spoken, probably from a main route in the north coast at the Muchik, but also Kiknyam was present. And there were other um, 
other um, um, dialects, it's, it's, it's difficult to assert, uh, but uh, there are at least from the 19th, from the 16th century and certainly the 18th century mentioned in the almost Tayan um, and many others, and even in the highlands, uh, Cholon, for example, uh, along with Quechua. So uh, there were many languages spoken in the area um, that unfortunately were lost, not only during, during, the, during the colonial time, but certainly during the Inca period, certainly the Incas were trying to get rid of uh, Kikñam. Uh, in the north coast of Peru as part of their massive interest of destroying Chimu civilization. So, uh, of course, talking from the north coast perspective. So, uh, that's, uh... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even though around 7 million people still speak Quechua, but it's like an adapted form of Quechua in the highlands of the, of the Andes. Uh, do we have time for a few more questions? Um, given the re really important connection between people and the sea, how much of a record is there of the folklore and the importance of certain animals in these cultures? The Nazca culture have ceramics showing orcas, and I'm wondering if the relationship with orcas and other sea creatures continued into the more recent cultures. But that would also relate to the moche and what you've shown, Gabriel. Yeah, um, there is very active and there is a lot of uh, traditions uh, we have recently supported um, a local author in Huanchaco, and we have published a book about the traditions. And there are some, uh, um, some, some of them uh, are, some of the legends are emphasizing not necessarily killer whales, but um, other types of, 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 of whales. And um, even earlier in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a writer from Lambayeque, um, uh, Leon Barandarian, who published uh, Mitos y Tradiciones a myth and traditions and legend from Lambayeque. And he wrote also a very interesting uh, uh, folk tales. Uh, there is one about whales specifically that, um, uh, and, 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 and the lords of, of the area. So yeah, I mean, there is a lot. Um, I think that we can push a little more and get more uh, information in, in the future because probably this is the last generation that has that knowledge and we really need to, to, to um, record all of those. Is the idea of excavating these sites in Peru a politicized topic? I mean, uh, um, developing excavation projects in Peru is a process that has to receive permission from the Ministry of Culture. Um, and it can take uh, quite a time. Uh, but also, I think, uh, in terms of politics, there's I mean, in Peru, you have archaeological sites everywhere. So I think that would be an issue. And I don't know, Marcus, whether you could want to talk something about the dimension and the, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the fact that Nazca is so big and that mm -hmm. can pose many problems in terms of protection and excavations. Mm -hmm. Well, um, actually, um, I am in the good situation that I compare a little bit the countries where I worked in Latin America. And um, I think that the situation in Peru is, is quite good. And I appreciate very much the efforts of the government to regulate excavation, because as you know, there is also a lot of looting in Peru. Um, as you said, uh, archaeology is everywhere. For an archaeologist, Peru is a paradise. <laughs> and um, also for the preservation conditions. But on the other hand, we have a lot of destruction. So uh, the state has to regulate and um, has to give uh, permits for professional excavation and has to control uh, this excavation. Uh, this is uh, controlled by specialists. And indeed, it's a kind of bureaucratic process to get a permit. But uh, there is always a good cooperation, and um, maybe there are other countries in Latin America which are more protective and do not uh, let uh, or permit so many excavation or protect, uh, well, evo avoid, um, for example, cooperation with. Uh, um, people from archaeologists from other countries. So I would say uh, in Peru, the situation is uh, 
very good. The uh, situation is controlled, sometimes a little bit bureaucratic, but uh, I think this is necessary to uh, control the issue. Thanks, Marcus. Um, the last question, do you have any research method to avoid colonial perspectives in your re research? I understand that is there anyone trying to get rid of that bias that it's the Western influence and, and, and trying to, to avoid that colonialism, which is embedded in, into, into our daily, in the daily basis. So I don't know if you, anyone has something to add there. Maybe I can start uh, looking from an <laughs> Um, uh, from an outside perspective, and definitely the uh, development of uh, the history of archaeology of uh, in Peru shows quite clearly uh, that in the beginning it was colonialized, let's say. So mainly the archaeology was done by people coming from uh, outside Europeans and US American. And uh, this situation, I think, has changed dramatically in the last 20, 30 years. And uh, I would say uh, you are the generation which took over uh, the, the initiative and now are dominating the archaeology in Peru. And um, let's say the people coming from outside are happy to observe what you are doing. So there has been really a change. Uh, and I see a process of decolonialization, and um, I find this is very good. Thanks very much, Markus. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks to our panelists. Um, I think it's been really enriching for all of us. Uh, and just to finish saying that if you haven't been to the exhibition, uh, do come there it's, it's still a few weeks to go before it finishes and just to invite you to our next online event which will take place in february the 11th a friday as well on the story of the incas and um, it will be available to book on our website in the next few days and it will be very interesting we will have dr bill siller from ucl terence daltroy from columbia uh, Andrew Hamilton from Chicago and Dr. Gabriela Ramos from the University of Cambridge, all talking about the different angles, uh, assessing the, the importance and relevance of the Inca Empire and their endurance during colonial times. So thank you all for coming and have a very good evening. Thank you.